over his rough spun shirt. He did not know what awaited him ahead, but he did his best to ready himself. Hey, what's up? It's Fur Trade ASMR, and today we are reading Chapter 5 of The Starless Crown. Acrid odor filled the lower reaches of the ca chasm. Like burnt chalk and oil, he took short whiffs, fearing it might be poisonous. He had witnessed miners being lowered into a deep shaft, a pit that was safe the day before, only to fall into a stupor or die from air gone bad. After several breaths, all seemed well, so he continued ahead. He edged around the brimstand outcropping and peeked at what lay beyond its shoulder. It took him several blinks to make sense of it. The raw chalk wall ahead looked like a shattered mirror. The cracks all radiating out from a crumpled copper egg near its base. The egg appeared to have been cracked open long ago, its edges blackened and torn. The shine rose from inside it. He squinted, but could just make out no details from the distance. Just go look, he told himself. Maybe I'd better not, he argued, just as forcefully. He chewed his lip, then nodded, and set out towards the mystery. With each step, the bitter, burnt odor grew. He gaped at the wall ahead of him. His gaze followed the cracks into the darkness overhead. A worry grew. This be the source of the earlier quake? If so, he feared any misstep could bring it all crashing down atop him. His pace slowed, but he didn't stop. Curiosity drove him forward. He could not resist knowing the truth. It was that or retreating into eternal darkness. So, he kept going. As he neared the shattered opening, the walls of copper looked polished and seamless, and over two hands breadths thick. Cringing, he noted something at the edge of the egg. A skeleton lay sprawled just outside half buried in chalk, as if drowning in the rock. The hue of bone was not white or a hoary yellow, but a dull greenish blue. He knew the color was not a trick of the glow, but some alchemy of pyrites and minerals that had infused into the bone over untold centuries. He skirted the dead, touching fingertip from forehead to lips to heart in solemn respect lest he wake the spirit trapped here he reached to the blasted opening of the egg wanting no needing to know what cast such a sheen into the dark he bowed his way under the crop to lintel all twisted and scorched and pushed into the glow. What he saw froze him in place. Gods below. The inside of the egg was the same seamless copper 
like a glass bubble blown by the subterranean goddess, Nethim. Its inner surface had shone from a complicated web of glass and piping and copper joinery. A golden fluid bubbled through those tubes, but the true source of the glow was on the far side, where it seemed that all the contravents led. A shape stood within a glowing glass alcove, like a shining bronze spider in a web. What manner of god or daemon is this? Despite the cold terror, he could not look away. The figure was a woman sculpted of bronze, as seamless as the copper shell. Her face was a handsome oval, her hair a smooth plate of the same bronze. Her limbs were long and shapely, with hands that clasped at the belly, hiding her privacy. Her breast, though mere suggestions, added subtle beauty. It was a masterwork skilled, of a skilled artisan, but it was the expression that captured his attention. Her eyes, closed, hinted at a hidden grace, while the shape and fullness of her lips suggested a profound sadness, as if somehow Rafe had already disappointed her. Who are you? he whispered. With his soft words, eyelids parted, revealing. A shout rose behind him. <sighs> he ducked and searched around, as a thief in his first instinct was to hide when exposed. He followed that instinct, hurried out of the egg, and drove and dove behind a nest of chalk boulders to the immediate left. The rocks were unusually warm, hot to the touch. Still, he tucked himself in tight. A glance to the side revealed that the chalk that brimmed the egg was blackened and scorched. He lifted a hand towards the surface. His refuge was close enough to the side of to the side of the egg that he could touch the curve of the copper on the side. With his palm raised, he felt no heat wafting from the metal. He tested a fingertip, then the rest of his hand against the cool copper, confirming the same. Strangeness upon strangeness. Under his palm, he felt a faint vibration. More shouts drew his attention. Back up the slope, where a score of lamps and torches now lit the upper tunnel. Orders were barked. The lights began to descend down the rockfall. As Rafe waited, the vibration of the egg faded. To his touch. Even the faint glow ebbed into darkness. His hiding spot did not allow him to see inside any longer. Still, he pictured the bronze statue in the glass alcove. He would have sworn it had responded to its voice, its eyelids opening. He gave a small shake of his head at such nonsense. Just a trick of the light. In short order, searches, searchers had descended to the bottom of the slope. After so long the gloom, Rafe had to blink away and glance away the glare of their bright lamps and flaming torches. He kept low, tight to the shadows, but all the focus appeared to be on the egg. No one seemed to be looking for him an escaped prisoner, as he had initially feared. In their haste, they must have missed the telltale signs of his trespass. At their forefront strode a pair of thick, muscled overseers 
dressed in their hooded blue cloaks, with short whips at their belts. They carried lanterns high. Behind them came a clutch of enslaved miners. A few held torches aloft, but they all had pickaxes and hammers strapped to their backs. But it was the last member of the party that nearly drew a gra gasp from Rafe. The figure shoved to the front. The man was far taller and thinner than the others. His long, silver-white hair had been braided, tied into a noose around his neck. He wore a long gray robe with its hood tossed back. His exposed eyes were branded by the stripe of a black tattoo. It was said to imitate a blindfold, representing such men's ability to see what all others were blind to. Across his chest, he wore a thick leather bandolier studded with iron, lined by square pouches each etched with symbols. Rafe hunkered lower. None of the chain miners even dared look in the man's direction. How could they? Here stood a holy shrive. It, it cannot be. Rafe have only, had only heard rumors of such a secretive sect. They were rarely seen. It was claimed most of the shriven were hundreds of years old. Though this figure looked no more than a decade or two older than Rafe. Stay here, the shrive ordered, and went alone into the now dark egg. The overseers flanked the opening, while the miners in tow nervously shuffled their ankles in chains. The shrive entered with no lamp, lantern or torch, still from inside the egg, strange lights flared, a soft chanting echoed out, then an eerie high-pitched cry set Rafe's teeth to aching. Everyone outside cringed and covered their ears as best they could. With Rafe's palm still resting on the copper shell, he felt the metal momentarily vibrate, then go quiet again. A white smoke billowed out of the egg, reeking of bitter alchemies. It drove the others away from the opening. From the cloud, the shrive reappeared. His features were dispassionate, but sweat pebbled on his brow. He stepped to one of the overseers, a man Rafe now recognized as the head maestrum of the mines. Have your team remove the statue and come with me. Those tattooed eyes hardened and take great care. Your will is ours, the man promised. Before the shrive swept past, he leaned closer to the maestrum. His next words were meant for the man, men's ears, though. The next words were only meant for the man's ears, though Rafe eavesdrop, eavesdropped from his hiding place. Afterward. None must know. The shrive's gaze swept over the chained men. The maestrum bowed his head, a hand coming to rest on the hilt of the curved dagger sheathed at his waist. It will be done. Rafe sank deeper into his hiding, confused, but knowing one certainty. I should not be here. By the time the bronze goddess was hauled out of the shell and up the treacherous slope, Rafe's knees ached from crouching for so long. It took all six prisoners 
threw ye to a side to carry her to the mouth of the tunnel. The shrive kept alongside them, while the maestrum trailed whip in hand. A second overseer remained behind to guard the copper egg and its secrets. Rafe sneered. He knew overseer Muskim all too well. In Rafe's pocket, he carried the man's wayglass. The overseer had taken clear pleasure in removing the fingers of his crew as punishment for the theft, searing their stumps with a smoldering brand. The prisoner who finally confessed, false though it was, had his throat slit. Rafe felt the press of the way glass in his pocket. While his thievery might have been partly to blame for the other's suffering, he carried no guilt for the torture and death. Such harsh punishment was ill-fitting for a petty crime, even down here. Rafe had thought Muskin would have simply believed he'd misplaced the way glass or lost it. Rafe had not accounted for Muskin's pleasure at inflicting pain of burning his mark on those beneath him. From his hiding place, Rafe watched the lights vanish into the tunnel above, one after the other, until the world shrank again down to the single pool of light from Muskin's lantern on the floor. The overseer stalked back and forth before the egg, clearly not happy to be left behind. Even less so about the press of the shadows from the man's nervous glances and how he jumped with every rasp of sifting sand or tumble of loose rocks. Muskin was simul similarly afflicted by Rafe's threat. Simul similarly afflicted as Rafe by the threat of darkness. Rafe waited for his chance. It was not long in coming. The man's tenseness worked its way down to his bladder. The warning signs were evident, even from the growing agitation of his pacing, the occasional clutch at his privates. Finally, Muskin swore and headed to the far side of the egg. He grumbled as he unhooked his breeches to free himself. Rafe waited for the splashing and the relieved groan. He then slipped from the, his boulders, and with all the stealth gained from many years as a thief, he crept up behind Muskin. Without even a single clink of his change, he stopped in the man's shadow. He eyed the hilt of Muskin's sheathed dagger. Quick now, he urged himself. Still, Rape hesitated. He had never killed a man before, yet he knew only death would free him from here. He could not risk a shout drawing the others back. He gulped and reached out a hand. As he did, a rumble sounded behind him. A trickling avalanche skidded down the slope. Muskin flinched and swung around. His stream splashed wildly, even more so when he spotted Rafe standing there. The overseer snatched for his rip whip, and Rafe lunged for the man's dagger. They both gained their weapons. Muskin's face purpled with anger, his chest swelling toward, swelling toward a bellow. Rafe could not wait. Nimble and fast, he sprang at the man. Muskin, still addled, tried to block him and failed. Rafe drove the blade through the overseer's throat. The point burst out the other side of his neck. The damage done, Rafe jumped back. Muskin dropped his whip and pawed at the impaled knife. Then he fell to his knees with a gurgle that turned bloody. His eyes went huge, both surprised yet knowing the truth. Rafe backed away, horrified and shaking all over. I am so sorry, 
he mumbled. While the overseer deserved the harsh end, Rafe had not wanted to be the one to deliver it. He had witnessed countless deaths, but none by his own hands. Rafe took another step away. Muskin's end took far longer than Rafe would have wished, long after the man toppled on his side. Blood continued to pool and spread. His chest rose and fell. Rafe stared unblinking until all movement stopped with a last rattled sigh. Rafe took another three breaths of his own before finally approaching the body. To the side, the bluish skull on the floor stared into empty sockets at him. Stared its empty sockets at him. He touched his fingertips from forehead to limbs to heart. It was less this time to ward off spirits than it was to settle himself to the task at hand. With this death, death Rafe had committed himself to one course, escape or suffer a worse fate than Muskin. Get on with it he whispered to himself. Working swiftly, he searched Muskin's body and found the keys to his ankle irons. As miners were commonly shifted from one crew to another, the locks were typically all the same. Still, he huffed with relief when the chains fell from his legs. He felt a hundred stone lighter, encouraged, he stripped Muskin of his blue overseer's cloak and used the man's water skin to rinse away the worst of the blood. Once satisfied, he set about trading clothes with the dead man, including the short boots to hide his scarred ankles. Lastly, he hauled on the overseer's wide belt and secured the whip and the dagger. He inspected himself one final time and pulled up the cloak's hood to shadow his features. He started to collect the lantern from the floor, then remembered. He returned to his pile of clothes and fished out the way glass. He was about to return it to the same pocket from which he had pinched it, when he noted the lodestone was no longer pointed towards the egg. Instead, it pointed in the opposite direction towards the tunnel where the bronze woman had been hauled away. Strange. Rafe sat back along the same course, climbing the slope with care. He reached the tunnel and followed the scuff of bare feet and boots. It was an easy trail to follow. He knew this path would eventually lead him to the mine proper. Still, he did not hurry. He had no intention of catching up with the others. He knew, once he got his bearings, he would split along another course, using his disguise and keeping his face hidden. He would do his best to escape the mine and flee. If he failed, it would mean his death and an end far worse than the one Muskins had suffered. Like all prisoners, Rafe knew the punishment for a prisoner who tried to escape. When he had been first dragged into the mines of chalk, he had noted the rows of decaying, bird-plucked bodies, all impaled from arse to mouth that lined the entrance. His pace increased with that memory. He had to force himself to slow. Overseers, the lords of the mines, did not rush about. And now was certainly not the time to be hasty, even when disguised. It would take, a st uh, it would take stealth and artifice to safely make his escape. As he hiked the tunnels, he pictured his freedom and all that it entailed. But the serene face 
the bronze goddess kept intruding. It's not my concern, he intoned, but deep down, he suspected he was wrong. And that is the end of chapter five. As always, thank you for watching, listening.